I was standing here looking at this piece because it's the view from our studio in Tahiti. Um, for those of you who don't know, we, I, I'm standing here in Venice, California, where my main studio is, but I also have a studio in Tahiti in a little motu called Taha. And this is the view of Bora Bora, which you may have heard about. It's probably the most famous motu or island in all of French Polynesia. And we normally go there to work every three months for about a month. And of course, with the quarantine, we haven't seen it now since last December. It gives me a little sadness, but it also brings me a lot of happiness remembering what it's like to work there. Those of you who do know my work know that, um, especially those of you who are close to me and know my work, know that my work has been inspired uh, over the last 32 years by the feeling of being alive. And that is based on the reason that 32 years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, stage four colon liver cancer. I was given two years to live, but the beauty of life, the part I really love is the unpredictability and I'm still here 32 years later. So my work, is all about everything you look at. It's all based on the foundation of the feeling of being alive. And by that, I mean, not just walking around and feeling like you're alive, but walking around and realizing that you're alive. And those of you who also know me know that my work for the last 32 years has been influenced by the wonderful relationship and learning experience that I had with Charles M. Schultz, who I call Sparky, who many of his friends call Sparky. And instead of me trying to explain myself further, I've always relied on Sparky's words to initially describe what I do. So let me just read to you something from Sparky's last publication. This is a book called Peanuts, A Golden Celebration. It was published in the year the Sparky died. This is a very large painting of our hero by Tom Everhart, entitled Nobody Barks in L.A. Tom is the only painter authorized by Sparky's agents, United Media, and himself to artistically render Peanuts line art and the only painter authorized to use them as painting subject matter. Tom Everhart became involved with Peanuts in 1980, when he was asked to render some drawings of the characters for a commercial project. A successful painter with no background in cartooning, this is true, Everhart prepared for the task by projecting peanut strips onto a 25-foot wall in his studio for closer examination. He was stunned to discover that blown up larger than life, Sparky's pen lines translated into painterly brushstrokes that closely connected to his own form of expression. His immediate fascination with Sparky's line, and line is in quotes, and that's very important that it's in quotes, and his remarkable ability to reproduce it impressed Sparky and launched their subsequent friendship and collaboration. Everhart's paintings have been exhibited at museums all over the world, from Milan to Minneapolis to Japan and in the Louvre and Paris. The things I learned from him as an artist were just as important to me as any of the professors I studied at in art academia. The day I met him in that studio, I felt that I had met a different way of seeing. And art to me is all about new ways of seeing and how you express how you see and try to show that to someone else. What I would really love to do is kind of give you a, a brief tour of the studio and then we'll get to my most recent work that I started at the beginning of this year, just a few months before quarantine, a body of work by the title of Coconut Radio. But let's, let's uh, start on a little bit of a tour, if that's okay. I, I have to explain that one of the things that is important and from the very beginning of my work was that because the work was supposed to be about being alive, it had to look like it was alive. And, and that meant it had to look like it was constantly growing. So I decided to make a regular um, schedule, if for no other word, of doing 
uh, series, uh, one after another. So you, you would see one series grow into the next series. So it, it gave the, the feeling of growing. So before we talk about Coconut Radio today, I want to talk to you about the work and the series that I was doing just before Coconut Radio so you can understand this process of, of how the work evolves and grows. Um, for a long time, uh, in the last couple of years, I, like probably the majority of artists, have been working on the themes and the thinkings of, of the global anxiety that we've all been going through for these number of years. Vulgar politics, uh, guns, uh, sexual inequality, racial inequality. I mean, just the list of things that cause a global anxiety to be, I was painting about, but I always use Sparky's characters as a kind of camouflage to camouflage uh, the, the immediate content of the work. And these paintings were called the Have Mercy paintings because it was kind of like <laughs> have mercy on us with, with this global anxiety. The piece was called Stormy. And this was about more about politics and the vulgarity in politics and the storminess of politics and how we as a people have to find our way to fly and maneuver our way through the storms and the clouds of these things. The bottom line is this work about anxiety that I felt like a responsible artist and a responsible citizen by doing and all the other artists were doing started pulling me down. I mean, I was starting to feel the anxiety and I was starting to get very depressed. So what I thought was is that I'm going to come up with something that deals with how to get over that anxiety. And the only thing that comes to mind, my mind of how we get past all the anxieties in the world is education. We need to talk to each other. We need to understand each other and share and, and celebrate how different we are from each other. I mean, that's, that's the wonderful about being human and mankind. Remember, the second word, mankind, is kind. So I was very down and my wonderful camera person, Jennifer, <laughs> comforted me and made me feel better about everything. So I all of a sudden started a couple of works, a small body of work called My Hero. And you may have seen some of these pieces. Um, it's Snoopy basically holding Woodstock and I'm represented by Woodstock and Jenny's represented by Sparky's character, Snoopy, holding Woodstock and, and being the hero. So from have Mercy paintings to my hero that saved me from these, that went into the Coconut Radio group that we're about to see. Coconut Radio is a term in Tahiti that they use for communication. And really what I wanted the work with, to be about was about education through communication. And Coconut Radio means the way they communicate in Tahiti. Like one person will say, oh, I heard it from Bob over in this island. And I heard it from Jean-Pierre over in this island. He told me this. And that's their Coconut Radio. That's how they talk. And oddly enough, we're doing it right now. <laughs> and so, as I said, I started this body of work, Coconut Radio, the first of the year. So maybe a month, two months before we went into quarantine. And it just rolled naturally right into it. And what I also wanted to do in Coconut Radio was protest anxiety with color. I, I went back in all of my color theory classes and all my color sensation sources and started building, build, building colors that I had been mixing for years that I hadn't used before and tried to make something so bright and so offensive to anxiety in a protest with color. So... We can go in the back room now and see some of the uh, paper pieces of Coconut Radio. And then we'll go upstairs and see some of the larger canvases of Coconut Radio. So this is where I do most of the paperwork, the smaller works. These are all 22 by 30, and this is from the Coconut Radio series. Every, everything in the Coconut Radio series is Tahitian motifs. And when I use Sparky's characters, I Tahitian them up by <laughs> putting in, you know, hibiscus in their ear like the Tahitians wear. Um, I said earlier, this group is called the palms. And I put palm fronds almost everywhere in these. 
is one of my favorites. Um, and all of them are the same thing with the palms. This is obviously um, Sparky's character of Snoopy's sister, Belle. Here's another one of the back ones, the back views. They're hard to see flat. You know, Belle, <laughs> if you've ever studied Sparky's characters, is really just Snoopy with big eyelashes and a nice little pearl necklace. <laughs> this was from a, a group of pieces that you'll see upstairs called uh, The Girl Can't Help It. And it was about a friend of ours that we took to Tahiti who danced with the Tahitians. And when the song was over, she was still dancing. And the Tahitians thought it was very odd that she was still dancing and the music was over and she just kept dancing. I think a little bit too much Tahitian rum maybe or something. <laughs> Another thing I tried to do with this group, since I wanted to do something that felt like I was redoing anxiety into happiness, I have taken many of my old drawings and old paintings and reworked them into this group. You, you may have noticed this. This was from a, a, it was a print I did called Mon Ami, a painting that I did a long time ago called Dog Lips. So they're all previous drawings that I have actually reworked. I, I had to do a lot of research into uh, what drawings would work in this series, which ones I could rework and make them look Tahitian and, and paradise and coconut. Um, do you know that Los Angeles planted 25,000 palm trees, non-native palm trees, uh, in the city of Los Angeles in 1931 for the 32 Olympics, just to make everybody happier and feel good. This is a uh, 40 by 60 inch paper. And these are not under the name of palms. These are all just individual names. Like this whole top row is under the name of laid back. And you can see each one of these. This is, this is laid back at noon, this is laid back in afternoon, laid back in evening, and laid back in nighttime. This gold took me probably, what do you think, Jenny, about 10 years to mix before I finally started using it. It's hard to get gold to scream gold. This piece was called You Are Always On My Mind. In every body of work that I do, every series that I do, I always try to make one or two or even more pieces that are a direct thank you to Sparky. And that's what this was. You're always on my mind. Uh, this one was called The Point. Uh, there's a special place in Tahiti where we sit under palm trees and meditate, and I come up with most of my concepts that I'm going to paint while I'm in Tahiti. Uh, and this is the last 40 by 60. This one's called Bow Down in the Presence of Greatness. And that one really what is kind of almost a theme of this whole body of work. It's like bowing down in the presence of greatness, bowing down to nature, bowing down to people, because we are nature. We're equally nature. And I really wanted to say that in this body of work. It's, it's weird. It's, um, I... I'm asked constantly, well, how has this whole illness affected you? How's everything affected you? How's, are you making paintings about it? And I initially say, no, I don't want to look back in a couple of years and remember this. I want to remember how I flipped that feeling and look back at my work. So let's, let's go upstairs. Um, I should show you these, though. Um, these are some of my precious gems myself. These are two original Sunday strips that Sparky gave me early on. And you can see how this looks like brush strokes. That was the very first one he gave me. That was, he probably gave me that in the very early 80s. So this is the main studio where I create most of the big works. This was the title painting for Coconut Radio called Sha La La. And Sha La La refers to um, another form of gossip in the islands in Tahiti. Like if someone's bad mouthing someone and they say, oh, that's a Sha La La. It's just rumors. So it was another form of communication and educating. You learn things through rumors and you learn things through communication. So 
I wanted to do a whole piece that basically felt that way. So once again, it's the character of Snoopy and the character of Woodstock being presented. And if you look on the left to right, that is the horizon line and the reef that you see in Tahiti. This is the reef that's always turning way far out in the water. And this is actually the island of Bora Bora that I was standing in front of in, in the big scale downstairs. If you look at the headdress on Snoopy, I've had people say to me, I never saw a headdress on any Sparky's drawings. How did you make it look like Sparky drew it? Or how, or how did you make it look comfortable to his characters? Um, because there's no headdresses in the strip. Well, actually, there is one wreath, and it's just a very minor wreath that Peppermint Patty wore in one strip. But it wasn't floral. It was just little leaves. So what I did was I went through Sparky's strip, and this wasn't the first time I've done this, but I went through Sparky's strip and found every still life I could find, like a little vase next to Charlie Brown on the table with flowers in it, or a vase of flowers next to Lucy sitting on the ground or flowers outside, hibiscus flowers flying through the air in one strip that he did. And I took all of those flowers from all those little teeny uh, still lives in his strip and put them together to make these headdresses. <laughs> and that's why they look so natural, like they came right out of the strip, why they look so comfortable. Uh, back in the uh, mid-90s, I did a group of paintings called Still Lives from a Cartoon Life. And these were nine foot tall paintings of just the vase <laughs> with the flower next to Charlie Brown. No Charlie Brown, just the vase. And the thing that's funny, because Sparky was such a funny guy. I mean, he had such a dry sense of humor that he said to me, he said, I was going to draw this strip today and I was about to put in these flowers next to one of my characters. I got all paranoid that you were going to make a giant painting out of it. So I had to do the flower perfectly. <laughs> this is the, the really bad part about losing your friends. I mean, I would have loved to have shown him how I put these still lives together to make Tahitian style imagery. He would, I know how he would have reacted and that gives me satisfaction, but damn, do I wish he could have seen it. And this one's called the Blue Lagoon. It's a name that we use many times in Tahiti because where we are in Tahiti, it's not very touristy. It's really like the country. When we're out in a kayak, you don't see anything else but sharks and stingrays. <laughs> Just the two of us. One of the very important aspects of the Coconut Radio series was that it was water. Because where we are, we live on an island the size of two football fields. And there's nothing else around for miles. So water is, is really the predominant uh, visual thing that we're looking at all the time. So I really wanted everything to look like water. I wanted the paint to actually feel like water. And that was the whole reason of, the, of how these are all made. I actually put the paint on the canvases first, flat on the ground, and then I lift them and I pour all the paint together at one time. So not only does it look like water, I make the paint behave like water as it's going into its drying position. These become very stressful works because, because I'm pouring the paint after I put it on the canvas, pouring it down, the paint has to still be dry. So, I mean, it has to still be wet. And the longer it sits, the drier it gets, and the less it will pour. So I have to have basically all the paint on the canvas within an hour. I have to know exactly what I'm putting everywhere. Imagine that. Imagine a painting this size, and you're having to know every inch of where the paint's going to go. That's what I'm faced with. Uh, this one is called Mr. Downtown, because on every island in Tahiti, there's always one guy who's very urban Tahitian. <laughs> I say all my paintings are about the feeling of being alive. Well, one of the things I think that you notice about the feeling of being alive is unpredictability. Life is unpredictable. <laughs> um, and when these paintings are poured, because I use a white glue in the paint, the paint always has a pastel look to it when it's wet, like a red will look pink. 
in a month when it dries, it'll look red. So we would literally watch paint dry all the time until it gets to the exact color. And you get these unpredictable mixtures of color because they're poured into each other. This is a piece called Floating with My Homies. Many times in Tahiti, we'll see a, a raft or a dinghy go by with tourists in it. And there are always, just without fail, there'll be 20 tourists in a, in a dinghy the size that would hold five people. Each image is something that we feel from being in those islands. So I'm really trying to give the onlooker the feeling what it be it feels like to be at the end of the world in a tropical paradise some place that right now <laughs> we would all love to be at i think in our minds this piece is called coconut tweet and the head, this is a typical headdress of some of the fire dancers and things in tahiti who are some of our best friends uh, somebody took a photograph of us of jenny and i out in our floaty way out in the lagoon uh, from their porch. And you saw nothing but Lagoon and this little teeny floaty and Jenny and I. Now, Jenny is represented by Snoopy with the headdress and I'm the little Woodstock because it's usually her floaty. I know everybody during this quarantine has tried to escape somewhere if they were lucky. Some people the whole time. Uh, Jenny and I just got away once or twice because I wanted to be here in the studio working. I've, I've never had a chance to work completely uninterrupted like this. So I've taken full advantage of the quarantine. I work seven days a week, all day, all day. And as you can probably tell by the end of this talk, I've done close to two years worth of work in the six or seven months that we've been in quarantine. So this was the one time Jenny and I got away. It's still supposed to be Tahiti. But we have um, some friends who have a beautiful, huge estate in Malibu, and their guest house is as big as my studio. And the title of this one was In the Boo with My Boo. So it was in the, they call Malibu the boo up here, and boo being Jenny. So it's one of the most frustrating things uh, about this whole period of time for me is that I've done all these couple years worth of work. It's just a short amount of time, but I really can't show people how how they really look and also the way it feels for example this painting it looks like there's a lump here where the orange is and the and the yellow but because they were all poured together it's one smooth like almost like linoleum surface there's no there's no ups and downs it's like you're looking down on water and all the things the coral that you see below and the fish they're all in that one pictorial frame that you're looking down on so here's the little gems. These are the things I really fell in love with. It's 400 pound rag paper. So it, you can, <laughs> you can literally hold it out. It's, and they're all different versions of the bigger pieces that you've seen. Cause I wanted it to be all part of the family. So this looks very much like some of the other ones that you've seen much like even like this one, very close. So you're kind of getting a family feeling which is what i wanted out of these was that's part of the of the renovation of our emotions is to feel family so this is um kind of central of my workspace and this is where i'm using a lot of these ketchup squeeze bottles these days because i can pour the paint down that i'm going to um, pour i can pour it down into a circle into almost like a pancake these are this is how the solutions that i mix up i mix them in these cups and i'll put them in these larger bottles and these are all my own unique colors that i've mixed everything that you see in here um there is a um who was a neurologist at harvard margaret livingstone and margaret livingstone found that the brain has three centers in it, one that sees color, one that sees shape, and one that sees motion. And those three centers for each person is different how they mix and how big each one is. So each person has their own sunglasses on or their own veil that they're looking through to see color. I'm constantly thinking about that, about how motion and how shape work with color and how one color next to another color makes you sad and how one color next to another color makes you excited 
and another color next to another color can make you aggravated and will make you want to move. I watch people. I can see it in their eyes when they're not even talking about what they're feeling when they're looking at one color next. And I know where they're looking because I've created all the pieces. So I'll go, oh, they're looking at that area where that really dark blue hits that yellow. And there's some drama there. And you can see them kind of set back like it was a movie that all of a sudden part of the movie became very dramatic. This is something that I, I always, I think is important to say because I, I am so fortunate and I believe me, I, it's been 40 years now since I first met Sparky. I still to this very moment feel so fortunate that he gave me the time, the insight and the education that, that he did that allowed me to be able to create these characters and even these, these palms authentically like he did. So the feelings that, and, and I don't mean to say now that I'm copying him, but the feelings that he could produce in his strip that made his strip so universal in so many countries. I mean, I know because I've had such a history with Peanuts now, there, there are countries where they don't, they translate it, but there are countries that they don't translate it at all. They just show the imagery and the imagery is enough. Uh, that's very typical in Japan. They don't really need the words, even if they're translated in Japanese, it's the imagery that speaks to them. And because I was fortunate enough um, to study under him like that and be you know, a rare individual to be able to do that, I can replicate that and that authenticity. Um, it's one of the things that I see missing. I, there's so much new, and I'm sure you've seen it, there's so much new Peanuts art now since Sparky's passed on. I mean, when, when he was alive, it was just me, because um, that was his intent. But um, after he passed on, many people around the world were starting to look at his strip to make art from, which I believe me, I was thrilled about. I mean, I had so many people come to me and say, aren't you concerned that they're, you're going to be sold, pushed aside for this person? And no, not in the slightest. I have been begging people since the day I walked into his studio in 1980 and that August day, when I went back to New York and told my graffiti artist friends <laughs> about my meeting with him, and the line that he was teaching me and, and the, the feeling from line that he was teaching me, they were so envious. And they just, at the same time, their envy turned into like fascination, like, wow, the things you can learn from this person. And I, that's the one thing that I feel so badly about all the new peanuts art that's coming out, whether it's paintings or drawings or, or marketing things. They didn't have, that opportunity to work with him, much less ever even meet him. So they didn't have that opportunity to be able to be so authentic. And, and, and I'm not bragging at this point. I'm saying that having that skill and having that ability to be authentic to what he did, wow. I mean, <laughs> I don't think I've been given many things in life that I can compare to that.